Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Two Schmo Show. Uh, I'm Leaf Miss Orion, and for some reason, I feel like I'm in mourning of something. I don't quite know. And I'm Cairo, and I'm a Schmo. Yeah. Uh, we got a big announcement today, I would like to say. I, I think we should uh, hold it off till later in the show. But I'm very excited to announce it. Are you Cairo? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, how's your week been? <clears throat> Good week. Good week. Good week. I've, been, I've been enjoying this cool weather. Dude, it's, after it's a the nice 90 change. degree like, heat wave, this is so mm-hmm. much fucking nicer. I cannot get over how miserable I was during all that. So Yeah, it was pretty brutal. We had to get our AC unit checked out at uh, mm-hmm. my apartment. And my AC unit is fucking old, right? Yeah. So, uh, pretty much we start running it, and it, it's built basically to just like have an open filter, so it doesn't even cool that properly because it's afraid of cigarette smoke destroying it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get the uh, maintenance guy to come take a look at it. He takes one look at it, and he says, I'm just going to get you a new air conditioner. And he says to me in a deep voice, like, that thing belongs in Jurassic Park. And then he just like <laughs> rips it out of the wall. Nice. Yeah. So, uh, did we miss anything last week? I feel like we missed something that may have been a little important. Or did we? I don't know. I don't know. Like, it, was, it was kind of sleepy. I don't know what you mean. A sleepy weekend. Yeah. Oh, sleepy week. Uh, where do you want to start, Carol? <laughs> um, so I think we'll get into the Supreme Court stuff in a sec, because that's going to be a whole fucking thing. <laughs> but I wanted to hit a couple of highlights real quick that made yes. my, uh, I thought stood out this week as being kind of like good-ish news. Okay. Uh, so the big one. Biden issued pardons for two, about 2,000 people convicted uh, under old military laws of gay sex. Sodomy, I guess would be a technical term. You know, I never realized it, but of course there'd be fucking anti-sodomy laws in the fucking military. Mm-hmm. Yep, it says about 2,000 people who had been convicted under the law and had military benefits withheld. This pardon would allow them to be able to apply to have those benefits reinstated. Should have been done a long time ago, but, you know, better late than never. So is that, like, dating back to, like, just as many people who are alive from those kind of laws? Or is it just a certain time frame? I don't know. I would imagine that if it's possible for it to apply to literally everybody who would have been impacted by that specific law that now no longer exists, they would do so, but... At the very least, it applies to all living persons who are impacted by it. That's good. That's good. I worry about the families. Mm Mm-hmm. Anything else fun? Yeah, and other news of better late than ever. uh, U.S. prosecutors have recommended to the Justice Department to criminally charge Boeing. Oh, about fucking time. Mm Mm-hmm. How many people have been almost killed? Uh, well, so if you count everything, there was at least two flights that uh, crashed as a direct result of Boeing's uh, cost-cutting actions in the late 20 teens. I don't know. What, what, what uh, do you so think is? Um, I'm sorry. No, go for it. Would you say cost-cutting actions like that do file under negligence, or would you say that's too severe of a term? That is what I am trying to... Personally, I would consider it negligent, yes. Same. Whether the law agrees with that, I think, is another thing. But mm. it seems like these prosecutors believe that that is the case. Uh, so officials determined that the company breached a 2021 agreement that had previously shielded Boeing from a criminal charge of conspiracy to commit fraud arising from the two fatal crashes in 2018 and 2019 involving the 737 MAX jet. 
2021 deal, the DOJ agreed not to prosecute Boeing over allegations it defrauded the FAA so long as the company overhauled its compliance practices and submitted regular reports. Boeing also agreed to pay $2.5 billion to settle the investigations. And the U.S. prosecutors finding that based in part on the whistleblower claims that have come out, that Boeing has not complied with uh, that overhauling of their practices. Oh, shit. Give them like three appeals in a time in the Supreme Court, and I think it'll be fine. Yep. Uh, also, likely that they come to a, an additional agreement and don't actually press charges. Uh, they'll have until July 7th for the DOJ to make that decision, but uh, it is a bit noteworthy that both Boeing and a spokesperson for the Justice Department have declined to comment on this Reuters article. Oof. So it seems that the two are in discussion over a potential resolution to the DOJ's investigation. And there is no guarantee officials will move forward with charges if an agreement is made. Well, that's not fun. Nope. You ever feel like sometimes we're the ones for sale and that the corporations are the real citizens, man? Mm-hmm. Wow, that is fucking wild. Criminal charges would deepen an unfolding crisis at Boeing, which has faced intense scrutiny from U.S. prosecutors, regulators, and lawmakers after a panel blew off one of its jets operated by Alaska Airlines mid-flight January 5th, just two days before the 2021 settlement expired. Sources do not specify what criminal charges Justice Department officials are considering, but one of the people said they could extend beyond the original 2021 fraud conspiracy charge. That's really fucking wild. Mm-hmm. Last bit of sort of goodish news. Uh, we'll see how this pans out tomorrow, but Steve Bannon has been requested to report to prison Monday. Supreme Court rejected his last minute appeal. Damn. You know, I almost forgot Steve Bannon existed. Mm hmm. It is especially funny because his uh, prison sentence is only four months. So if he had just served it when he was originally charged, he would have been out by now. But as it is, he's going to be in prison for basically the entirety of the election cycle. Well, wasn't he and Donnie already, like, not working together? I thought they hated each other at the moment. I don't know. That could be true to an extent, but I, he's still a major voice for conservative causes uh, in general. Oh, but, you know, that's fair. <laughs> Otherwise, what I've got is about 20 open tabs on Wikipedia from the Supreme Court and a handful of movies. So, Jesus. I'm so scared. The Supreme, the Supreme Court, Court news has definitely been taking up the bulk of the uh, the news cycle lately. It's disgusting. Like, I'm, I'm mad for several reasons, for obvious reasons, you know, because this is stuff that was a long time coming. <laughs> Uh, where do you want to start with this? Because I want to talk about the big Chevron one, but... So I was thinking we can go uh, just, just chronologically, I think, is the only way to, like... Paint a picture? Really? Yeah, just, like, goes... Because the, the current uh, Supreme Court term has had a number of pretty major cases settled in it. And they have, at the same time, been punting a lot of them uh pretty far down the road fair okay so we've got three uh more decisions that have not yet been decided or have not had yet had their rulings released that are set to have that happen uh this coming monday and that was an additional day that was added to the supreme court's calendar that was not originally scheduled because they've been punting these decisions for so long I love your term of punting. It paints such mm. a picture. Because punting sounds like grunting, and I know these fuckers <laughs> hate their job. 
Oh, <laughs> well, in, in this case, I think it's a football term. Well, I, I know, but I mean, like, yeah. you know, I like to dabble in poetics, good sir. I like to think metaphor has a lovely place in our language, and mm-hmm. I will fucking assign meaning to your word choice. Fair enough. <laughs> doing a quick skim through a, a couple of these to try and thin these out because most of these are uh, pretty dull, honestly. The big one that we can start at, uh, decided back uh, in May, is the... No, sorry. That's not the right one. Uh, decided in May. The Alexander v. South Carolina State Conference of the NAACP. This was the case decided, I believe, 6-3 along party lines that basically allowed the uh, current or it ruled that the South Carolina congressional districting map was not racially gerrymandered, even though it was explicitly gerrymandered along partisan lines. Wowie zowie. The first partisan gerrymandering case taken by the Supreme Court after its landmark decision in Rucho v. Common Cause, which stated that partisan gerrymandering claims present political questions beyond the reach of the federal courts. And the first racial gerrymandering case since the court's decision in Allen v. Milligan, uh, which is a Supreme Court case related to the redistricting, related to redistricting under the Voting Rights Act. Hmm. Uh, where is it? Supreme Court made its decision on May 23rd, 2024, reversing the district's court's ruling that the redistricting map was racially gerrymandered, though remanded the case to rehear other claims brought by the defendants. The decision allows the state to use the maps as drawn up before the challenge. The majority opinion in the 6-3 case, decided along ideological lines, was authored by Justice Alito. So yeah, that's a pretty, pretty bad one. Yeah, I would say so. Racial gerrymandering, yep. I, I would say it's uh, pretty low on my list. Yep, and is explicitly uh, unconstitutional. But yeah. if you just do your racial gerrymandering and uh, slap a sticker over it that says we only use political parties, it's suddenly not racial gerrymandering anymore. What do you know? If it just so happens that those political parties serve like one racial majority over <laughs> yeah. another, you're, you're just looking too into it. It's um. Uh, what's the word for that one party? It's like white supremacists. I'm sure that's a coincidence. What the fuck is a white supremacist? I'm sorry, a white supremacist. What else do you got? Uh. A term that I don't recognize here, so I'm trying to find where it has just a good picture. Trying to quickly determine what... Uh, okay, yeah. So, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau v. Community Finance Services Association of America. Uh, Supreme Court case where the court ruled that the funding mechanism of the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, which is allocated from the federal treasury budget rather than through the congressional appropriations, is constitutional under the appropriations clause. 7-2 decision written by Thomas, dissent by Alito and Gorsuch. Uh, I believe, yes, so this was the payday lending thing. So the Community Finance Services Association of America is a trade group for the payday lending industry. Filed a lawsuit in 2018 challenging the CFPB, who oversees their industry, uh, challenging a rule restricting payday lending. It's usually a good sign when the trade association group uh, can't challenge the actual rule that was passed and has to try and claim that your entire organization is unconstitutional. <laughs> a good sign those birds are noisy so i'm gonna close my door i could hear them yeah i need to top up my bird feeder oh so they're trying to you know uh what's the word i'm looking for shake you down pretty much pretty much little bastards uh still in may we have a couple more yeah let's the last may case 
uh, National Rifle Association allow a government regulator to threaten regulated entities with adverse regulatory action if they do business with a controversial speaker as a consequence of the government's own hostility to the speaker's viewpoint or the perceived general backlash against the speaker's advocacy. It was found that the NRA plausibly alleged that respondent violated the First Amendment by coercing regulated entities to terminate their business relationships with the NRA in order to punish or suppress gun promotion advocacy. This was a unanimous decision. So you're telling me that, I'm sorry, was it for or against? Because it did cut out there slightly. Uh, in favor of. Well, of course, it's the fucking NRA. They practically, you know, they get their own little pass to do anything they want. Kind of. This is a bit more clear cut than that, though, thankfully. Um, authored by Sotomayor. Uh, for the unanimous decision in favor of the NRA, stating, quote, government officials cannot attempt to coerce private parties in order to punish or suppress views that the government disfavors. The decision further held that government officials cross the line into impermissible coercion when they engage in conduct that, quote, viewed in context could be reasonably understood to convey a threat of adverse government action in order to punish or suppress speech. Hmm. Okay. So, fuck the NRA, but kind of makes sense. Tragically, tragically, tragically. Yeah. Um, skimming through here is kind of funny. You can kind of tell, like, which, which articles are, uh, sorry, which articles, which decisions are major or not by uh, how long the Wikipedia page is, whether it has <laughs> sections for the arguments that are presented. Okay, Bacara v. San Carlos Apache Tribe. Case determined that the federal government must provide additional funding to cover some third-party administrative costs incurred by Native American tribes that operate their own health care programs. Roberts, writing for the majority, joined by Sotomayor, Kagan, Gorsuch, and Jackson, affirmed the arguments by the tribes that third-party revenue streams were subject to reimbursements by the IHS. Uh is does it not actually have it well oh well Roberts contended that the arguments of the government were inconsistent with the text and purpose of the ISDA as the ISDA was intended to provide an efficient voice in the planning and implementation of programs responsive to the true needs of their communities and ordered that the potential of not covering contract costs of outside programs would result in a penalty on tribes for opting in favor of greater self-determination Additionally, Roberts noted that the covering costs was necessary to prevent a funding gap between the tribes and the federal government, sitting that if IHS does not cover these costs to support a tribe's expenditure of program income, the tribe would have to divert some program income to pay such costs, or would have to pay them out of its own pocket. Either way, the tribe would face a systemic funding shortfall relative to IHS, a penalty for pursuing self-determination. So, in favor of the uh, Apache tribe. Makes some sense. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a weird part of U.S. law where there's uh, probably like an entire section of lawyers that just deal with being experts on, you know, U.S. government and tribal relationships as far as the law is concerned. Honestly, I don't mind that, though. Mm hmm. Yeah. Rudy plurality. Is this one? I, oh, this is weird. Give me a second here. This I, I believe this was decided unanimously, but with different justices joining concurrently in different parts. As we have uh, the case opinion, the majority was written by Thomas except part three, joined by Alito, Gorsuch, Roberts, Kavanaugh, and Barrett, but only for parts 1, 2A, and 2B. In plurality was by Thomas, who wrote part three as well, joined by Alito and Gorsuch, concurred by Kavanaugh in part, joined by Roberts, 
Additionally, concurred by Barrett in parts, joined by Kagan, Sotomayor, only for parts 1, 2, and 3B, and Jackson, only for parts 1 and 2, and concurred by Sotomayor, only in Judgment, joined by Kagan and Jackson. So, Vittle v. Elster. Case dealing with a provision in the Lanham Act regarding trademarks using the name of living individuals without their consent. The court decided that the provision does not violate the free speech clause of the First Amendment. An examining attorney at the U.S. United States Patent and Trademarks Office refused registration, stating that the use of the word Trump in the mark would likely be constituted by the public as a reference to Donald Trump, and that without the then-president's written consent. The registration had to be refused. Elster appealed to the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, which, at the request of the examining attorney, remanded the matter back to him for further examination, at which point he identified other provisions of the Lanham Act that would forbid such a mark. The board agreed with the examining attorney that bars the registration of the mark, as it included the name of the president without his written consent. On appeal, the uh, Federal Court of Appeals reversed the judgment of the appeal board, stated that the application of the law to Elster's mark unconstitutionally restricted his speech in violation of the First Amendment. Court stated that content-based restriction contained within the law would typically trigger an immediate or in intermediate or strict scrutiny that, absent an important or compelling state interest in privacy or the public interest, does not meet the high bar set by these standards of judicial review. Uh, January 13th, or sorry, on June 13th, the court unanimously ruled that there is no First Amendment issue with those provisions of the Gundam Act and reversed the Court of Appeals decision. So... You cannot register the trademark uh, in all caps. Trump too small without Trump's written permission. Until he dies, and then it's fair game. Oh, so give it about 10 years. Yeah, and or yeah. 10 minutes. It depends how much caffeine and Adderall he's had today. You know, when they were doing the debate uh, last Thursday, I knew the reason why they didn't have an audience was purely because if somebody in the audience went, boo. He probably could have killed both of them. <laughs> Jump scare. Jump scare. Oody -boo -doo -boo -doo -boo. You know, it would actually be very fucking funny if we started doing that for presidential debates. Like, there's a guaranteed jump scare for both the candidates just to see how mm -hmm. they respond to, like, surprises. Yeah. Yeah. Come this, on. This is an example of how to handle an unexpected situation. Heart yeah. attack. <laughs> I'm saying it sounds necessary. I think we should embrace turning our presidential elections to fucking game shows at this point. It's basically there already. Almost. Almost. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about no more debates. We send them to fucking Wheel of Fortune for a special episode. Then we send them to Jeopardy for a special episode. Then we'll have maybe like a political commentary thing. They can go on a couple talk shows, whatever they need. But I'm just saying the media circus needs to put more circus in its media. Next case. FDA v. Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine. This is the Mifepristone case. Oh, no. It was actually a as good of one as could have been uh, expected with the Supreme Court ruling unanimously in the favor of the FDA. Uh, court issued its unanimous decision June 13th that the alliance lacked standing to challenge the FDA's approval or rulemaking. The decision reversed the fifth court ruling and lifted the injunction. Kavanaugh wrote the opinion, uh, stating that while the alliance may have moral and policy concerns on Mifepristone, because they did not prescribe Mifepristone, they failed to demonstrate a legally cognizable injury to challenge its use. The alliance's claim that it might treat patients who suffered complications from using Mifepristone were also rejected, as Kavanaugh wrote, quote, federal law fully protects doctors against being required to provide abortions or other medical treatment against their consciences, and therefore it breaks any chain of causation between FDA's relaxed regulation on, of Mifepristone and any asserted conscious injuries to the doctor. He also stated the doctors have never had standing to challenge FDA drug approvals simply on the theory that use of the drug by others may cause more visits to the doctor. Thomas concurred, uh, stating that the alliance did not standing, but also challenged the concept of association standing that was argued based on the 1927 case, blah, 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 blah. 
uh, wrote, if a single member of an association Association has suffered an injury. Our doctrine permits that association to seek relief for its entire membership, even if the association has tens of millions of other non-injured members. Hmm. Ultimately, allowed the FDA's ruling to uh, broaden access to Mifepristone to stand, and you can currently go out and buy it on store shelves. Oh boy. Let's go get some mm -hmm. right now, Chiral. I actually had a chance to. <laughs> Did you? No, because I am not a woman, nor planning to get pregnant anytime soon. God damn it. Big shock, I know. <laughs> Live on the Two Schmo Show, Mifeprazo and Tasting. Here's something dystopian, right? We start doing like mm -hmm. mukbangs, but with like uh, over the counter <laughs> pharmacy <laughs> drugs. That would be so boring. <laughs> Wouldn't it? <laughs> Gulp noise simulator. No, what we do is like we start mixing the drugs a little bit here and there so they go down faster. Mm -hmm. To our brave listeners, our very smart and intelligent listeners, don't do that. I will not be sued for this. That is not advice. All right. Getting into some of the spicier stuff now. Garland v. Argyle, the bump stock case. Oh, fuck this case. Okay, go on. Yeah. A uh, question presented to the court, whether a bump stock device is a machine gun as defined under a current law because it is designed and intended for use in converting a rifle into a machine gun, i.e. into a weapon that fires automatically more than one shot by a single function of the trigger. Supreme Court ruled 6-3 on party lines that the ATF has exceeded its statutory authority by issuing a ruling that classifies a bump stock as a machine gun. With the notable caveat being that this case was not uh, a question of the Second Amendment, given that bump stocks are not firearms themselves, and that an act of Congress would legally be permitted to regulate the ownership of bump stocks. But yeah, it's uh, uh, pretty dumb. Heavily. Which are, uh, Justice Sotomayor arguing, arguing that the majority opinion would render the National Firearms Act less effective uh, gave the pretty great quote of, when I see a bird that walks like a duck, swims like a duck, and cracks like a duck, I call that bird a duck. Skipping this one, because it doesn't really matter. Probably going to be skipping this one as well. Now I'm curious. Uh, Siegel Vitz versus V. Fitzgerald, if you would like to follow along at home. This is a bankruptcy court's question that was decided unanimously. But given that it only has a single paragraph on uh, Wikipedia, I'm inclined to give it a skip because it seems like it was decided pretty uh, leanly. Congress passed bankruptcy, tr bankruptcy Judgeship Act of 2017, increasing fees dramatically in tr trustee program districts. The Judicial Conference extended the hike to administrator program districts, but only for new cases. Circuit City filed bankruptcy in 2008 in a trustee program district and saw its fees dramatically increase due to the hike. It challenged the increase as violating the uniformity requirement of the United States Constitution's bankruptcy clause. The bankruptcy court agreed, but the United States Court of Appeals reversed over the dissent. Uh, was granted in 2022, the Supreme Court issued a unanimous opinion reversing the Fourth Circuit as to the constitutionality of the fee increase while remanding for consideration of what the remedy should be. So the fees apparently need to be, what was the word that they used? Uniform. 
uniform. And they are not, so they are unconstitutional. Diaz v. United States. In a prosecution for drug trafficking, where an element of the offense is that the defendant knew she was carrying illegal drugs, uh, does the rule permit a governmental expert witness to testify that most couriers know they are carrying drugs and that drug trafficking organizations do not entrust large quantity of drugs to unknowing transporters? It was held that expert testimony that most people in a group have a particular mental state is not an opinion about the defendant and thus does not violate the rule. Sent by Gorsuch, joined by Sotomayor and Kagan in a 6 3 decision with Jackson in concurrence. I remember about this one, but I can't remember the details of why it was like kind of hinky. I can't say I'm too familiar with this case uh, myself. I have a vague recollection of it. Court ruled 6 3 that the expert testimony of, quote, most people is not an opinion of the defendant and is admissible under the federal rules of evidence. Oh, I'm not going to get into it too much because it's, you know, federal rules of evidence kind of thing. It's not the broadest reaching decision, but I, I do, because I, I remember it was notable that Gorsuch wrote the dissent and was joined by two of the liberal justices, and it was, everyone's kind of like, damn, that's kind of weird. Yeah. But I don't remember the exact details of it. Okay. More v. United States. Questions whether the 16th Amendment authorizes Congress... Excuse me. Uh, whether the 16th Amendment authorizes Congress to tax unrealized sums without apportionment among the states. Um... What is this? This is a weird one. This is another weird one where it's just like, why is this a 7 2? And it has all these weird concurrences. Judge Kavanaugh, writing for the majority, ruled that the tax fell within the authority of Congress under the Constitution. Kavanaugh was joined by Roberts, Kagan, Sotomayor, Jackson. Barrett wrote a concurrence, joined by. They still don't really go into it. In a dissenting opinion, joined by Gorsuch, Thomas wrote that the mandatory repatriation tax should have been struck down as unconstitutional because it taxes unrealized capital gains, which is not permitted by the 16th Amendment. Hmm. The Supreme Court could have used the case to rule on the wider question whether a wealth tax is constitutional. However, the majority opinion sidestepped that question by explicitly adding a footnote stating that the opinion, quote, does not address taxes on holdings, wealth, or net worth. However, journalist Ian Milhazer disagreed, stating that the opinion included a bonanza of loaded language that any competent tax lawyer can seize upon to protect their richest clients from wealth taxes. Well, of course. Like, why is this it news? Like, yeah, it's like... <laughs> Yeah. Always. Oh, who is this guy? Correspondent for Vox. Mm, this was another one of these that Alito, Alito was uh, questioned as who as to why he did not recuse himself. Which is why this one's kind of notable. Okay. A couple more before we get into. There's actually there's a lot more. <laughs> it's a busy season. And I've been actually skipping about half of these. Have you? Um, I have, yes. Fuck, these bastards were busy. Yep. Uh, pure curium, skipping. Oh my god. This is a... Which, which one is this? It, whenever there's like... This has one, two, three, four, five concurrences in a dis and a dissent. Uh, Second Amendment question. Whether... Mm, Yes, so this is actually a pretty major one. So, United States v. Rahimi. Case regarding the Second Amendment of the United States and whether it confers the government's ability to prohibit firearm possession by a person with a civil domestic violence restraining order in the absence of a corresponding criminal domestic violence conviction or charge. Fucking what? 
Okay. Supreme Court reversed the Fifth Circuit in an 8-1 ruling and upheld the federal law prohibiting the possession of firearms by persons subject to domestic violence restraining orders. In its decision, the court refined the Bruin test, stating that in comparing modern gun control laws to historic tradition, courts should use similar analogs rather than strict matches. Basically, the circuit used the Bruin test that the court made last year and ruled that because domestic violence restraining orders didn't exist when the Second Amendment was passed, that they could not be restricted by the Second Amendment. And the Supreme Court was just like, uh, no. Also, though, it is a pretty good highlight of why the Bruin test was dumb to start with. Skipping that one. This one's a bit of a messed up one. Okay. Department of State v. Munoz. Finding in which the court held that a citizen does not have a fundamental liberty interest in her in, in their non-citizen spouse being admitted to the country. Fucking what? Barrett delivered the majority opinion, joined by Roberts, uh, blah, 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 rejected the assertion that she had a fundamental liberty interest at stake. In order to claim, quote, an, an enumerated constitutional right, Barrett said, Munoz must show that the asserted right is deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition. Pointing to Congress's history of regulating immigration of spouses, Barrett concluded that the right asserted did not meet the Glucksburg test. Sotomayor wrote the dissenting opinion, joined by Kagan and Jackson, agreed that the government should win the case, saying that the consulate's conclusion that Asensio was affiliated with MS-13 was a facially legitimate and bona fide reason, sufficient with a uh, prior case. However, Sotomayor faulted the majority for deciding more than necessary and for narrowly construing the fundamental right to marry recognized in cases like Oberfell Shri Hodge, criticizing the majority's use of Washington v. Glucksburg to find that there was no constitutional right implicated in this case. Sotomayor said that Oshrell rejected what the majority does today as inconsistent with the approach this court has used in discussing the fundamental rights of marriage and intimacy. So, the dissent agreed that the individual in question should not have been allowed entrance into the state because of other circumstances, but this was not a constitutional-based issue. Yeah. Could be a case that comes around uh, as the conservatives of the court, particularly Alito, um, have pretty brazenly called out Obergefell v. Hodge as a decision that they would like to uh, overturn, uh, which is, you know, uh, gay marriage, basically. Fuck that. Mm hmm. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna do a quick scan here because we're we're getting into the juice. I promise. Okay. The new the new juice. These are cases that were decided this last week. Snyder v. United States, a Supreme Court case in which the court held that 18 U.S.C. 666 prohibits bribes to state and local officials, but does not make it a crime for those officials to accept gratuities for their past actions. But they should put it on their income taxes, right? Probably. <laughs> but this is pretty insidious, truly. Um, basically, say you're a congressperson, right? Yeah. And you vote in favor of a law to deregulate the oil and gas industry. You do it completely of your own volition. This makes it legal for oil and gas executives to personally give you basically anything after the fact as a gratuity. Well, is that as long not as you did my not... right as a congressperson? Apparently it is. I was about to say, motherfucker, you can't take away my gratuities. That's really fucking scary. I like yeah, to this, this. This is an idea of of uh, the 
ramifications of this case in particular. Uh, so far on the Wikipedia pages, they all follow a pretty consistent um, framework for how the articles are set up, where they have a little summary at the top, a background tab, uh, any injunctions or other filings that were done in the intermediate period between when the case was taken up and when it was actually heard, and then a little section with what the Supreme Court's uh, ruling actually was. In this case, they also have an implications and public and legal commentary tab. Featured in the public and legal commentary is the section, legal scholars and commentators have expressed concerns that the Snyder decision may lead to increased corruption and influence peddling as it creates a significant loophole by not criminalizing gratuities. The decision underscores the ongoing debate over the balance between preventing corruption and respecting the authority of state and local governments. And then they backed it up with five citations. You know, it's, you kind of fucked up when Wikipedia put the commentary section. Because that's like their mm-hmm. one job is no commentary. Yeah, pretty much. Curious if I can find it real quick here. Um, I think I missed it. It went too far. No, I didn't this one so even the the uh, mifepristone case doesn't have that section included on it no it has an impact but it does not have uh the public and legal commentary or implications dear god we're so, fucked yeah. this one's really bad like yeah. really really bad where that... we actively have multiple cases open right now of people in congress Directly taking bribes, explicit bribes, and to have a loophole opened up is exceptionally dangerous because in effect, right, this doesn't make it so that uh, gratuities are legal. This makes it so that bribes are legal as long as you don't have evidence of the conversation having taken place ahead of the time. No. I mean, why would you ever keep, like, receipts on something like that? Exactly. Because you shouldn't have to say, oh, no, no, this wasn't a bribe. This was a gratuity for my doing something in their benefit. And that's perfectly legal. And, you know, damn well, Congress isn't going to regulate themselves. Never. Yeah, it's, uh, it's bad. Would you be shocked to learn this one was decided on party lines? No, I would not be shocked. I'm a little more shocked that like, I don't fucking know. I, I, I'm just, I'm too angry to give a good metaphor or like a simile because yeah. that's just, yeah, bullshit. it's just fucked up. Yeah. Cause you're basically giving like a kid, a firecracker and a match and asking him to self-regulate himself. Yep. Don't like that firecracker. Don't you dare. One day these fuckers will die. Hopefully. (laughs) Knowing our luck, quite frankly, immortality is a thing. We just aren't rich enough to have it. Yeah. I look, look at Biden, man. Look at Jimmy Carter. Yeah. Carter's a bit of an anomaly. I don't know how Carter's still alive. Like, I'm I'm glad he's alive. Don't get me wrong. Yes. It's all those peanuts. Damn it, Jimmy. It's like those uh, fucking thoughts and prayers memes. Everybody stop praying for the former president. He's too strong. He is 99. I'm okay with him. October 1st, he'll be 100. I'm okay with 100 years of Jimmy Carter. I'm curious if that would make... I I feel like if it's not already the case, like, is he the president who has lived the longest? Uh, Like, in history? (laughs) Yeah. At 99 years old, Carter is the longest-lived former U.S. president. 2012, he surpassed Herbert Huber... 
I forgot about Herbert. January 2017. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In, sorry. January 2017 and 2021, he became the first president to live to the 40th anniversary of his inauguration and post-presidency, respectively. He then well, also was... became the oldest former president to ever attend an American presidential inauguration. You know, Jimmy could go to the next inauguration. Oh, this is unfortunate. Uh, Carter entered hospice care several months before celebrating his 99th birthday at his home, said in a 2019 interview with People that he never expected to live as long as he had and that the best explanation for a longevity was a good marriage. Carter has made arrangements to be buried in front of his home at uh, noted in 2006 at a funeral in Washington, D.C. with visitation at the Carter Center was also planned. According to his grandson, in June of 2024, Carter is no longer awake every day. Oh. So he's, he's, he's on the way out. Yeah. He's not. I don't very much the it. hospice situation. It sounds like he's got three months to make it. Yeah. Uh, on that note, Murphy v. Missouri. <laughs> so this is a, this is a bit of a contentious one, um, because the actual question presented in this case is one that probably should have a clearer answer to it but the supreme court did not rule on the questions presented they decided that uh the individual nor the state plaintiffs uh filing on their behalf have article 3 standing to seek an injunction against any defendant so they don't they can't file this case because they were not the ones they cannot demonstrate that they were harmed by the people that they are trying to sue right yeah um this is the case where during covid misinformation in specific relation to the coronavirus and masking and vaccines was being removed from social medias in this case, specifically Facebook. Mm -hmm. The plaintiffs here claim that the government had communication with the, or sorry, not communication, that the government uh, coerced, I think would be the more appropriate term, coerced social media companies, specifically Facebook, to ban or otherwise inhibit the posting abilities of certain individuals on their platforms. So they're and, saying, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, go for it. So they're trying to surmise that any like negative activity they've gotten on, like from moderation on the fucking internet in social media yes. is all the government psyop. No. Okay. No, this was specifically instances where there were members, um, I, I believe, of the Biden administration at this point who were, because there's, you know, emails that were included as evidence in this case, uh, communications between members of the Biden administration with members of Facebook's uh, basically government contacts, for lack of a better word, where the government was specifically asking about instances, posts, types of posts and why Facebook wasn't doing more to crack down on those. The specific question that uh, was included in this article is whether the government's challenged con sorry, whether the, the, whether the government's conduct being challenged here transformed private social media companies, content moderating decisions into state actions. And in a result violated the respondents first amendment rights. And I think that's a legitimate there is a there is a question there, right? Yeah. If the government says we don't like these types of posts and we want you to do more about them, and that social media company after that point does something about those posts, has someone's rights been violated by the government, or was it just a content moderation decision? And unfortunately, the result of this case doesn't answer that question at all. 
they ruled that the claim damages did not occur or that the damages that are claimed did not occur at the hands of the people being sued as a result. Mm. And I will say, while I am fully in support, because it makes sense at you know, a very fundamental level, right? You want companies in general to feel open in their relationship with the governments that they operate under, to be willing to collaborate with that government, to seek resolutions that benefit each other as well as the general common good. Yeah. So and the government having contact with social media at all isn't a problem here, at least in my mind. I'm sure people would disagree with that. But in my mind, that's not a problem. It's whether there was a threat on the part of the government. You know, if the government is th threatening Facebook, saying, hey, take this down or we'll do something to take it down ourselves, then it becomes a problem. And they didn't rule on that. So. Well, I think yeah. it's a scary decision for their own. Like, I can't say they're mm -hmm. all the post personal interests, but like. I, I agree with you that the government should be able to interact with business in some degree. Yeah. Uh, it's just a matter that if they start putting regulations on it now or like questioning the regulations on it now, uh, I feel that sets up a lot of future problems for their, for a lot of the personal interest of those in the SCOTUS or friends mm -hmm. of SCOTUS. Yep. The Supreme Court issued its decision June 26. The 6 3 majority determined that neither the states nor other respondents had standing under Article 3, reversing the Fifth Circuit decision. Barrett wrote the opinion stating, quote, To establish standing, the plaintiffs must demonstrate a substantial risk that in the near future they will suffer an injury that is traceable to a government defendant and redressable by the injunctions they seek. Because no plaintiff has carried that burden, none has standing to seek a preliminary injunction. Uh, and then Alito wrote the dissent, joined by Thomas and Gorsuch, that actually focused more on the free speech aspects of it rather than the question of standing. Mm. So I would not be surprised to see a similar case be brought to the court or even... Uh, this exact case under, you know, a new coat be revived to clarify the damages that happened because I don't know, it's tricky. Yeah. Is having your post, you know, what, what is the damage of uh, your the First Amendment being violated, right? And how that interacts with social media in general is uh, it's murky and would have been nice to have it clarified. <laughs> Jesus, this is a big one. Which one is this? SEC versus Jarkesy. Jark Jark Jarksy? J A R K E S Y. I do not know how to pronounce that. I'm gonna say Jarksy. What you got? Mmm. There's another one that was a bit spicy. Uh case before the Supreme Court questioning the uh that under certain statutory under certain statutory provisions, the Security and Exchange Commission's administrative adjudication of fraud claims without jury trials and their administrative proceedings with their own administrative law judges, rather than Article Three judges, violated three provisions of the Constitution. The judges ruled that the Securities and Exchange Commissions violated the Seventh Amendment, which is right to a jury trial. Mm. So. Basically, the result of this 6-3 uh, decision penned by Roberts with the dissent by Sotomayor joined by Kagan and Jackson means that in criminal, I don't know, criminal complaints filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, defendants will now have the right, should they request it, to have their trial heard by a jury rather than just by a judge. Hmm. 
Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So to with the descent, joined by Kagan and Katasha Jackson Brown, uh, called the majority decision a devastating blow to the manner in which our government functions, as the majority had opted to ignore the long-standing public rights doctrine, which used a test that when Congress created a public right in which the government is partly is a party to the litigation, they can assign the matter for a decision to an agency without a jury consistent with the Seventh Amendment. The decision, Sotomayor argued, would create confusion about how public and private rights should be handled. So yeah, uh, one of the major uh, rebuttals I've seen to this is that if you are being, if you do have a case before the SEC, you probably don't want a jury trial because juries tend to side with the government more than companies when there's a question of impropriety on the part of the company. Um, the other side of that, though, is that if you're a company and you know you did something wrong, 10 times out of 10, you're going to be requesting a jury trial because it's going to take a hell of a lot longer. Mm. So that's the the ultimate impact, right? Is yeah. that it gives another mechanism for fraudulent or you know criminally negligent companies to further gum up the uh, justice system. What are you talking about, dude? They're just doing it so they can spend more money. Duh. Because more trial means more lawyer fees. Duh. Mm -hmm. I'm kidding. That really has nothing to do with this. Is that right one? I'm not sure. I'll have to double check that. Uh... Next up, Harrington versus Purdue Pharma. Oh. So this one was this a five four? One, two. Yeah, five four. Majority this was so a weird decision. Uh, majority by Gorsuch, joined by Thomas, Alito, Barrett, and Katasha Jackson. Dissent by Kavanaugh, joined by Roberts, Sotomayor, and Kagan. This is a weird one. I'm not okay. sure where I fall on this. So I'm gonna actually read through a fair bit of this because there's a lot to go through. Uh, this case is regarding Chapter 11 of the Bankruptcy Code. It is about the settlement by Purdue Pharmaceuticals for opioid victims who overdose with the OxyContin drug produced by their company. The judges determined that the Bankruptcy Code does not authorize the claimant's order blocking the bankruptcy plan. Okay. So, a little bit of background yeah. is that, obviously, Purdue Pharma, maker of OxyContin, was... Uh, believe they were sued of course by families of people who had overdosed as a result of taking their drug and that where did it go In the year Purdue Pharma filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, where the excuse me, the Sackler family did not. As part of their bankruptcy proceedings, Purdue Pharma saw an injunctive stay on all of the lawsuits toward the company and the Sacklers. Uh, one of those suits being by the Department of Justice, alleging that the acts of Purdue Pharma defrauded the United States and violated uh, federal statutes. In accordance with the bankruptcy code, a mediation was opened to avoid the liquidation of the company. Eventually, a plan was agreed by the company, the Sacklers, and 15 other non-consenting states. The plan was for the Sacklers to contribute $4.325 billion in exchange for any third-party lawsuits against the Sacklers to be enjoined. This meant that any claims made towards the Sacklers would not be tried, and the Sacklers would be free of those liabilities. This agreement was eventually agreed upon by Justice Robert Drain, was deemed to have satisfied three of the court's criteria. The bankruptcy plan was appealed to the District Court for the Southern District of New York, which reversed and vacated the bankruptcy court's ruling, deeming the bankruptcy code did not permit these third-party releases. It was subsequently appealed to the Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. The court of Appeals reversed the District Court's ruling, reaffirming the bankruptcy court ruling, holding that it is statutory permissible for the approval of these releases under the bankruptcy court, and it was consistent with the Second Circuit case law. was appealed to the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, Biden administration, uh, on, behalf, on, on their behalf, uh, urged the court to review the entire bankruptcy proceeding by Purdue Pharma, calling it an unprecedented agreement that would protect the family from opioid-related civil claims. 
who were granted a stay. And this is like a ha really like half of an article. It doesn't have the actual uh, stuff about the decision that was made. Uh, hmm. It's from Grit Held that bankruptcy code does not authorize a release and injunction that, as part of a plan of reorganization under Chapter 11, effectively seek to discharge claims against a non-debtor without the consent of affected claimants. Uh, so, yeah. The downside of this is that it also vacates the, like, $4 billion that was set aside by the Sacklers to, you know, go towards opioid programs that mm -hmm. were caused by them. The upside being that it reopens the door for further lawsuits against the Sackler family, especially. Uh, from what I recall, when this was happening in, like, 2019, that was one of the major pieces of contention was that while Purdue Pharma was taking some amount of liability for this, it was completely shielding the Sackler family in particular who sparked the entirety of these circumstances that led to it. I have no idea how I feel about any of this. Yeah, it's tricky. Yeah. Ideally, this should get sent back. Or I guess ideally, the bankruptcy claim is voided and further cases should spring up now that should result in similar effects, right? Yeah. Um, but it's going to take time for that to happen. Next case, Moyle v. United States. Ooh. Case whether an Ohio, I'm sorry whether an Idaho abortion law convict conflicted with the Federal Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act. Questioned whether EMTALA preempts state laws that protect human life and prohibit abortions, like Idaho's Defense of Life Act. What fucking horrible wording that is. Uh, uh, this case was decided in the writs of certiorari before judgment uh, were dismissed as Im God, why can't they just use real words? They vacated the case. The okay. prior case. They said it was wrong and that Idaho's law was not allowed, basically. Uh, this is 6-3 concurrence by Kagan, joined by Sotomayor and Jackson. Another concurrence by Barrett, joined by Roberts and Kavanaugh. Dissent by Alito, joined by Thomas and Gorsuch. All nine justices wrote or joined separate opinions. It's a great sign. Justice Kagan wrote a concurring opinion, joined by Sotomayor and in part by Jackson. In Kagan's view, the court never should have granted judgment or a stay in the district court's order. She argued that Idaho's law is preempted by federal law when continuing a pregnancy does not put a woman's life in danger, but still places her at grave health consequences, including loss of fertility. In Barrett's concurrence, joined by Roberts Kavanaugh, she agreed that dismissing the case was now correct as new developments in the case had made it better to send the case back to lower courts. Lower courts. Lower courts. Briefing and argument had shown that the extent of the party's dispute was unclear, evolving, and narrower than it initially seemed. For example, the U.S. government told the court that mental health conditions never require abortions as stabilizing care, while Idaho told the court that abortions are permitted in all the medical conditions that the U.S. government had identified, even when the woman is not at imminent risk of death. Based on concessions like these, Barrett concluded that even with the preliminary injunction in place, Idaho's ability to enforce its law remains almost entirely intact, not enough to show that Idaho would be irreparably harmed. Justice Jackson agreed that with the court's decision to allow emergency abortions by vacating the stay, but disagreed with the decision to dismiss as improvidently granted, which she saw as an unnecessary and harmful delay. She would have ruled on the merits in favor of the U.S. government. Alito dissented, joined by Thomas and in part by Gorsuch, explaining that the court should have decided the case on the merits now in favor of Idaho. Alito focused on several parts of Mtala, referencing an unborn child to argue it does not require abortions. He also argued that Mtala as the spending clause legislation implies that it does not bind Idaho or preempt Idaho's criminal law. So, yeah, the last part there was the greater crux that was at risk the idea that because mtala you know allegedly references unborn children um that abortion 
Oh, you cut out. At least has not been held to be true. So for the time being, at least, uh, you can get a medically necessary abortion in Idaho. Uh, However, this case being decided as it did kind of leaves the door open for a future case that, you know, might restrict that right of women. That's a common theme I'm kind of noticing here. Yep. Kick the can down the road until you're dead. Yeah. What's up with that? Why don't our law mm-hmm. enforcers want to do law enforcement shit? Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll get to that one in a second, because we've got one, two, three. Yeah, we've got one... No, this one's actually a pretty big one, too. Uh, All bangers here on out. Fisher v. United States. Supreme Court case about the proper use of the felony charge of obstructing an official proceeding established in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act against participants in the January 6th United States Capitol attack. Supreme Court ruled 6-3 that the charge only applied to tampering with physical evidence used in an official proceeding. Majority by Roberts, joined by Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, with a concurrence by Jackson, dissent by Barrett, joined by Sotomayor and Kagan. June 28th, the Supreme Court vacated the D.C. Circuit's ruling and remanded the court the case. Sorry, remanded the case for further proceedings. Justice Roberts wrote for the majority, saying that the government must establish that a defendant, quote, impaired the availability or integrity of records, documents, or other objects used in an official proceeding. Roberts wrote that a general phrase can be given a more focused meaning by the terms linked to it, and stated that the scope of the obstructing an official proceeding provision is sensibly inferred as limited by the proceeding evidence tampering provision. Roberts noted that there would have been scant reason for Congress to provide any specific examples at all if the obstruction proceeding could be applied so sweepingly on its own. In a concurring opinion, Jackson wrote that it beggars belief that Congress would have inserted a breathtakingly broad, first-of-its-kind criminal obstruction statute in the midst of a significantly more granular series of obstruction prohibitions without clarifying its intent to do so. She stated that courts reviewing January 6 cases may judge whether the statute could apply to January 6 defendants due to potential impacts on electoral certificates and other documents during the riot. Justice Barrett, joined by Sotomayor and Kagan, filed a dissent saying that the court's reading of the statute is too limited and requires the majority to find any way to narrow the reach of the law. Barrett wrote that while an event such as January 6th would not be the envision target of the obstruction provision, a textual focused interpretation of the provision allows statutes to go further than the problem that inspired them. Hmm. But your- Professor Prosecutor's estimate that the ruling could impact about 250 of the roughly 1,400 people who were charged in the Capitol attack. About 350 people were charged under the obstructing unofficial proceeding provision, for which prosecutors are now required to demonstrate an evidence tampering related motive. Notably, this included President Trump, former President Trump, though it is unclear on some of his obstruction charges, as they are obviously unique. Love it. Love it. Love it. Mm -hmm. We are never getting out of this. Nope. All right. Chevron. Chevron time. (sighs) Loper Bright Enterprises v. Raimondo. Court was presented with the question of whether the court should overrule Chevron or at least clarify that statute silently. The stat- sorry, that statutory silence concerning controversial powers expressly but narrowly granted elsewhere in the statute does not constitute an ambiguity requiring deference to the agency. I'm scared. <laughs> the result in a 6-3 decision was the overturning of the Chevron decision. Boo! So, for background... Chevron was decided, I believe, in the 80s during the Reagan administration at a time when the courts were far more liberal. Actually, how, how does it go? 
I believe that's right. The courts were more liberal than they are today, and the administrations under Reagan were more conservative, I believe. And Chevron was decided at the time to grant the... Is that right? I might be getting it backwards. Let me double check. Okay. Because this one, this one's, it's, it's complicated. Yeah. And the actual results of this decision is um, not going to be immediately felt, I would say. So, together with its companion case, Relentless Inc., the Department of Congress, sorry, Department of Commerce, it overruled the principle of Chevron deference established in Chevron v. Natural Resource Defense Council in 1984, which had directed courts to defer to an agency's reasonable interpretation of an ambiguity in a law that the agency enforces. Both cases originated from fishing companies challenging a rule established by the National Marine Fisheries Service for fishing companies to pay for the cost of federal monitors that may be assigned to their boats under authorization of the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act. The company claimed that the act did not allow the National Marine Fisheries Service to pass the monitors' costs to the fishing companies, challenging the Chevron deference that was held in the National Marine Fishing Service's favor during the lower court hearings. Okay. Okay. In 1984, the courts ruled in Chevron that courts must defer to the authority of administrative agencies' interpretations of a statute whenever both the intent of Congress was ambiguous and the agency's interpretation is reasonable or permissible. In its opinion, the court outlined a two-step test on when to grant deference, known as the Chevron deference. The court reasoned that ambiguities in statute may be a delegation of authority from Congress, thus limiting a federal court's ability to review an agency's interpretation of the law. In the first step of the test, the court would ask whether there was an un ambiguous expression of congressional intent contained within the statute. If so, then the court must yield to congressional intent. If not, then the court would proceed with the second step of the test. It would ask whether the agency's application of the statute was based on a reasonable interpretation of ambiguous wording. If so, then the court would defer to the agency's interpretation of the statute. If not, then the agency's interpretation was likely to be deemed impermissible. Here, reasonability was determined by the specific factual circumstances present in the case. Since being handed down, Chevron had become among the most frequently cited cases in American administration law, with over 17,000 decisions from lower federal courts having cited the case in their rulings, and 70 decisions by the Supreme Court itself having cited Chevron. Between 2003 and 2013, circuit courts applied Chevron in 77% of decisions regarding regulatory disputes. In years prior to the current case, the Supreme Court, with a majority of conservative justices, had been seen as leading towards weakening or overturning Chevron. Uh, while this case did not overturn Chevron, it defined the major questions doctrine that was used in future cases to question the interpretation of administrative law when the financial impact of the law had not been considered by the agency. Okay. On June 28, 2024, the Supreme Court issued a 6-3 decision striking down Chevron deference. Roberts wrote the majority opinion, which held that Chevron deference conflicted with the Amer Administration Procedure Act as, quote, under the APA, it thus remains the responsibility of the court to decide whether the law means what the agency says. Continued, Congress expects courts to handle technical statutory questions, and the judicial venues allows for additional input from interested parties via amicus briefs. Roberts' opinion stated that, Prior administrative actions and court decisions decided under the Chevron deference are not overturned by this decision, and in lieu of Chevron, agency interpretation can still be respected under the weaker Skidmore deference established in Skidmore v. Swift & Co., 1944. However, Roberts said the principle of stereocesis does not apply to the Chevron deference in general, as the court had been struggling to apply it over the last several years, making it unworkable. In the specifics of the Loper Bright case, the majority opinion also found that the 1976 Magnuson Stevenson's Fishery Conservation and Management Act did not authorize officials to create industry funded monitoring requirements. Hagen wrote dissent, which joined by Sotomayor and Katanji Brown Jackson. Kagan was critical of the majority's position with concern for the disruption that eliminated she that eliminating Chevron would create. 
She also wrote that while the majority may believe that agency decisions may still be respected by courts, if the majority thinks that the same justices who argue today about where ambiguity resides are not going to argue tomorrow about what respect resides requires, I fear it will be gravely disappointed. So yeah. Leading Sorry. to this, <laughs> yep. I would like to make our announcement that uh, the Tushmo show, since no one can stop us now, um, we would like to establish a new department in yes. the federal government. Uh, we would like to refer to ourselves now as the Supreme Court Max. Mm. Are you, are Supreme you, Court Pro Max. Pro Max. You know, I like that better. Yeah. It's the top of the line. Yeah. So, uh, without further ado, we'll be asserting our authority as soon as possible. Uh, if anybody would like to stop us, please mm -hmm. see, uh, you know, get your federal agents uh, to all make a... Oh, what's the word I'm looking for, Cairo? Uh, unanimous and ambiguous stature on that? Mm-hmm. Uh, and well, we'll see you in, uh, you know, yep. two schmo show Supreme Court... Uh, Pro Max Court. Yep. Yep. This is stupid. Yes, it is. And in conjunction with the later uh, case that we'll be talking about here, it gets worse. <laughs> mm -hmm. That that should be the slogan of the current Supreme Court uh, tenure. It gets worse. But wait, it gets worse. What what was the worst of this? Well, I guess Ohio I... v EPA. Shut up. Okay. Um, <laughs> I believe this is one of the few five four decisions that the court actually had here. So okay. we'll, we'll get into it in a second. Um, okay. But I have an adjoining uh, above the law article that is very good. What you got? So we'll, we'll get into that in a second. Um, okay. But yeah, Chevron deference going away is not great. Uh, the idea that um, the, you know, when, when there is ambiguous wording, the idea that the administration of the executive will not be given deference in determining that ambiguity <laughs> is certainly concerning, uh, though one could also argue in the long term if the administration was to change to be not under Biden, for example, it would allow for greater challenges to the administration decisions of that executive, if you mm. catch my drift. Mm. In the event that that happens, I imagine they'll find some hinky loophole to work around it. Or like what happened in uh, uh, the... Uh, Reagan administration, they just bring back some pseudo Chevron equivalent and be like, nope, actually, you can't do that. Uh, before we get to Ohio v. EPA, though, citizen, or sorry, city of Grants Pass v. Johnson. This is a really fucked up one. Oh, no. So. Does a local government's enforcement of a public camping ban against involuntary homeless people violate the Eighth Amendment's protection against cruel and unusual punishment? In a 6-3 decision, they found it does not. The enforcement of generally applicable laws regulating camping on public property does not constitute cruel and unusual punishment prohibited by the Eighth Amendment. Can we challenge That's that a really definition? insidious framing. The framing yeah. of this being camping on public property. Why? Because that's yeah. not what the law is. Well, also, can I just bring this up? Doesn't camping camping also imply a recreational aspect to it? Yes, it does. Yeah. It, it implies some sort of intentional trespass. Yeah. Rather than needing to partake in a bodily necessity. Like, imagine, as an example otherwise, a city passed a law against public urination mm -hmm. and then also passed a law prohibiting individuals who own 
private property from allowing individuals who do not reside at that property to use restrooms of those properties. And mm. then, in combination with that, did not allow for any public restrooms to be made. If you're now somebody who doesn't own property or reside at property and you need to use the bathroom, you can't because it's a crime. And that seems pretty straightforward. But when they phrase it in the way of anti-camping, it's all of a sudden fine to make it illegal for people to sleep. So here's another thing for you, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I know this is mainly targeting homeless people, right? Yep. But, like, what happens, say, if someone were to act... Like, say we have Joe Schmo in the park... Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. falling asleep after working a 10 hour shift or something like that. Yep. That's yeah. a crime. That's a crime. That's a crime. That's camping. That's him setting up, you know, yep. just this one off situation. Yep. Fuck. Anti camping, anti sleeping and parking exclusion ordinances is how it's described. Parking. So they're targeting even people sleeping in their own car. Yes. Fuck that. Yes, that is illegal in Grant's Pass. Okay, I need to look up Grant's Pass. Is this just tiny like town. a... Is it tiny? Yeah. Huh. Oh, yeah. It, it's not particularly large. Okay, I'm going to look up the zip code. And then I'm going to run that through the wealth uh, uh, predictor zip code reader. In 2010, they had 34,000 residents. Okay. Now I'm going to run their zip code. Nine, seven. You ever heard about uh, zip code searching for wealth? No, but it makes sense. Yeah, doesn't it? It's really fucked up. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah, they're fairly uh, pretty welfare themselves. Mm hmm. Yep. Uh, on the Wikipedia page, they say that uh, their economy up until the 70s was largely funded by lumber. And since then, they have had to resort to a, uh, what do they call it? Um, service industry sector covering outdoor sports, recreation, and healthcare. And marijuana. Because, of course, why not? How do a whole bunch of fucking stoners go off on this kind of tangent? Because they're Republicans. Republican stoners infuriate me. So fascinating. I'm what just, if we what? Sorry, I'm just looking at the website. That's yeah, yeah, it's income, ice. yeah. I, anybody really just wants to look at where you sit economically? Income by zip code is a free website. I highly recommend mm -hmm. it. Although it's not exactly the most accurate website at times, I mm -hmm. still recommend it because like. For example, they do it by averages. So if you have any like high value homes in like that area, like because we all know like this situation of like um, one high number can drive a whole smaller population that's more condensed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that 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 happens sometimes. Uh, what's our next Supreme Court decision? Um, yeah, one second, let me close some of these out. Yeah. Ohio versus EPA. Goddamn. Boy. <laughs> this one's pretty fucked up, too. So, Clean Air Act is a law intended to reduce the impacts of air pollution. In the Clean Air Act, there's a section called the Good Neighbor Provision, which mandates states to implement policies to reduce the impact of air pollution on other states, such as asthma or bronchitis. In October of 2015, the EPA set new standards for reductions of ozone pollution. 
the requirement this required states to submit state inspection or sorry state implementation plans in 2022 the epa announced that it would be denying 23 states sips in response the epa proposed a federal implementation plan that amended the national ambient air quality standards the epa had a right to do this under the clean air act three plaintiffs collectively referred to as ohio filed an emergency appeal to the supreme court Ohio claimed that the EPA's federal implementation plan would put undue pressure on the U.S. electrical grid. The EPA argued that the plan contained important public benefits that, if halted, would cause delays in improving air quality that could be harmful. The EPA also argued that Ohio did not demonstrate any harm that would arise if the plan remained in effect while the legal proceedings continue. The Supreme Court did not put the EPA plan on hold while legal proceedings were underway, and in a 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court decided that the EPA plan would be stayed pending petition for review and writ of certiorari. Hmm. Gorsuch delivered the opinion of the court, which Roberts, Alito, Clarence, and Kavanaugh joined, claimed that the EPA's methodology in the report was misreported and incorrect. They applied the Clean Air Act section that allows a court to reverse a federal implementation plan if it is arbitrary or capricious and found in favor of Ohio. Barrett delivered the dissent, joined by Sotomayor, Kagan, and Burt Jackson. The dissent argued that the petition did not meet the criteria for emergency release and that the case should be reevaluated on its merits. So... I quite enjoy uh, with Ohio v. EPA and Chevron deference both being killed, I think literally one after the other, maybe it was even on the same day. Uh, we got a great article uh, in Above the Law written by Joe Patrice titled, John Roberts said judges should decide how much rat poison is too much for your hot dogs. <laughs> Supreme Court's overruling Chevron fulfills every lawyer's delusion that they're smarter than real doctors and scientists. Uh, it's a great article, and I highly recommend reading the entire thing, but uh, a few choice excerpts from it. Uh, quote, for non-lawyers, when Congress writes statutes that say, for example, hey, maybe we should have an agency that protects against poisonous food additives, they don't actually list every chemical imaginable because they can't know what someone is going to invent down the road. But they do know a government agency could hire scientists who clock new inventions and can figure out which fall into a broad category of bad stuff. In the Chevron decision, the Supreme Court ruled that judges should begin from the assumption that the agency is likely right about what is and is not banned under those broad grants of power from Congress. Today, the Supreme Court decision to instead, sorry, today the Supreme Court decided to instead give that power to federal judges. I love federal judges. They've never done anything wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, quote from the decision, perhaps most fundamentally, Chevron's presumption is misguided because agencies have no special competence in resolving statutory ambiguities. What? Uh, to which the author responds is, putting aside the statutory ambiguities in the, sorry, putting aside that the statutory ambiguities in these cases are actually scientific or otherwise highly technical ambiguities, whether chemical, physical, or biological integrity of the nation's waters covers a specific chemical, the agencies are also much better positioned to interpret the text of the statutes. Agencies are staffed by the same sorts of people who draft, testify about, or lobby for the statutes in question. In some cases, these are literally the same people. Judges are decidedly not those people. For a lesson in how bloggers can get, consider the case of Catherine Mazel, an associate only just now removed from her clerkship that Trump rammed onto the federal judge in his final days. When charged with interpreting the ambiguity over whether or not the CDC could issue a mask mandate under its authority to impose sanitation measures to prevent the spread of communicable disease, Mazel ruled that sanitation means the clean sorry, sanitation means measures that clean something, not ones that keep something clean. Her basis for for this decision was a review of dictionaries from the 1940s that used the word sanitation to mean quote trash collection so yes isn't that just that is where we are now at yeah isn't that just basic misrepresentation though yes but that is the goal fuck me that is very much the point of this is that it gives them the legal avenue to misrepresent You know, we had a good thing going on in America for a while. Sometimes you just Did gotta... We? Before we were born. 
Yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah. Sometimes, Kyro, you just got to know when to hold them and uh, know when to fold them. Mm -hmm. You know who said that? Who is that? I don't know who said that. (laughs) I did see a great meme the other day on Twitter. Let's see if I can put it up real quick. Oh, did I not save it? I don't know where I put it. That's unfortunate. Uh, Did I? Oh, maybe I didn't bookmark it, but I did like it. Because I didn't want to retweet it up on a government watch list. (laughs) Yeah, here we go. Uh, So somebody said, don't get it twisted. All paths out of this mess involve, among other things, the dismantling of the Supreme Court. And somebody replied, apropos of nothing, let me share a hilarious meme. And it's just pictures of the Supreme Court justices with addresses over the top of them. Oh, my God. I saw this one uh, meme very similar to that, where it was a minion, and the minion was holding a sign. And it was uh, basically just Clarence Thomas's uh, home address on it. Mm-hmm. I, 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 Amazing. I, I love this kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Anger. All right. With those done, there are three more cases left to be decided by the Supreme Court in their current session. Presumably, they will be heard or they will be have their decisions hand down tomorrow. If they don't, all bets are off. <laughs> Presumably, if the, these decisions aren't heard tomorrow, they are being deferred to the next Supreme Court session, which I from my understanding is not something that is like explicitly allowed by the Supreme court. Mm. I, from my understanding is that when they start to hear a case, once it reaches a certain point, they have to actually like give a decision on it. They can't just sit on it with their thumbs under their butts forever, you know? Yeah. Cause there's speedy trial kind of things. So first one, Moody v. NetChoice, as well as Paxton v. NetChoice, pending Supreme Court cases related to protected speech under the First Amendment, content moderation by interactive service providers on the Internet under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, and it's due to state statutes passed in Florida and Texas that sought to limit this moderation. While originating with statutes in two different states, the Moody and Paxton cases are discussed tandem because the Supreme Court is likely to review them together. Section 230 is passed as part of the Communication Decency Act of 1996, which offers interactive service providers such as social media platforms certain immunities from legal liability for content posted by their users, as well as a Good Samaritan clause for such providers to moderate content that they deem obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable, whether or not such material is constitutionally protected. Section 230 has been considered an essential part of the rapid rise and success of the internet in the United States. Leading up to the 2020 presidential, sorry, 2020 United States election, there is a rise of misinformation on those services related to topics such as claims of election fraud and conspiracy theories related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Much of this information originated from conservative parties, including the far right and alt right. Services like YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook took action to moderate such user-generated posts, either by tagging them as misinformation or removing them altogether. Some of the affected content that was put forward by Republican Party members, including then-President Donald Trump, leading the Republican Party to question the efficacy of Section 230 in the belief that this law allowed politically motivated restrictions of social media content. The Republicans were further emboldened when Justice Clarence Thomas, in a dissenting opinion on the 2020 case Malwarebytes v. Enigma Software Group, suggested that Section 30 gives too much immunity to service providers and that its goals should be revisited. In 2021, Florida passed state bill whatever and Texas did the same, addressing the ongoing controversies over social media moderation and instituted contradictions to the procedures required under Section 230. Hmm. So... We have no idea what this is going to look like, whether it would be a redefining of the allowances of Section 230. Ideally, it should just be thrown out entirely. The idea that uh, when 
a party's actions become so extreme that they run afoul with prior law that rather than holding those parties accountable to the law, we should redetermine what that law means is pretty wild and doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You bring up a great point. Mm -hmm. Second case yet to be heard. Corner uh -huh. Post Inc. v. Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. This case about the statute of limitations for judicial review of federal agency rulemaking under the Administrative Procedure Act. It's come up a couple times today. The legal question under review is whether a challenge to the validity of a rule must be brought within six years of the rule's issuance or instead within six years of when the rule first injures the particular plaintiff challenging the rule. Uh, not heard much with regard to this one, but I you know, could certainly see where this comes in. Um, a bit surprising is that this one hasn't been given its ruling yet, since it seems a little bit more straightforward. But the lawsuit is a challenge to the 2011 regulation of the Federal Reserve Board setting the maximum fees that large banks can charge merchants for a debit card transaction. The question for this report is limited to whether the case was properly dismissed because of the statute of limitations. Beyond the particular case, this has wider significance for whether federal regulations more than six years old can still be challenged for procedural defects in their enactment. Hmm. I have to imagine they'll say you can challenge them after that point. It would be pretty strange for them to say otherwise, you know? Yeah. But we'll have to see. And the big one, the one that hasn't been uh, decided yet, but has a larger Wikipedia page than just about any other case we've talked about today. Trump v. United States 2024. The question of presidential immunity from criminal prosecution, criminal prosecution, and to what extent, if at all, it exists. You can't see it, but I'm making one hell of a grimace right now. Mm-hmm. Initial reactions. Uh, Trump's claims for absolute immunity have been rejected by most political commentators and two lower courts. In a unanimous ruling by the three-judge panel of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, the court stated that if Trump's theory of constitutional authority were accepted, it would collapse our system of separated powers and put a president above the law. Charlie Savage of the New York Times wrote that Trump's immunity claim challenged a hallmark of American-style democracy, its suspicion of concentrated power. Further stating that rather than a presidency at least theoretically checked by law, the country would be ruled by presidents who could open, openly commit official crimes with impunity so long as enough allied lawmakers remain sufficiently loyal to block any impeachment. Hmm. Yeah. There is truly only one decision that could come about in this case that would be sensible and not overturn the rule of law in the United States. And... It's pretty terrifying that that is not the only possibility that we are preparing for today. So, fingers crossed that we can go into the new year without having to worry about presidents doing whatever the fuck they want and having the legal impunity to do so. But I mean, like, okay, sorry, so like, the July Fourth. Yeah. If he did that, I mean, what's stopping Biden from just going full fucking crazy? Under a broad interpretation, literally nothing. Yeah. Uh, the concern comes in that they try to make some sort of carve out specific to the Trump administration or the particular case involved. But yeah, I'll give literally you that. nothing. I'll give you that. Like, particularly, so so that's the thing, because uh, I actually, for one of the first times in my life, I listened to some of the oral arguments for this case live as it was happening. Um, and the particularly concerning part of it is in that specific regard that the, I guess it would be defense in this case, plaintiffs, I'm actually not sure what side he falls on, but Trump's lawyers were basically they were arguing for that mm. that that 
should be how it is interpreted. Now, we could have it come back still and have the court find that it's actually somewhere in between where an amount of immunity exists, but it is not absolute or it's only related to, you know, certain actions while president. But we don't know. Mm. Spooky, isn't it? Spooky is an underselling of that, you know, the dread, <laughs> but we'll say so. Yeah, why not? You know, it's a spooky. The Sony, Sony pictures <laughs> by oh. Alamo Draft House. Holy shit, we're free, everybody. It's done. Jesus At least Christ. until probably, probably the week after next, because I have a feeling with the holiday weekend, we might not be having a show next week, but we'll see yeah. how that goes. Um, yeah, Sony Pictures, the first film company since the... Let me actually figure out which, which law it was. Um, is there a Wikipedia? Like, like, I'm just so tired of SEO garbage. Just give me, just give me Wikipedia. Really, SEOs like are just gone they're they're no longer usable i'm sorry yeah search engines are no longer usable because of how seos have fucked them over yeah pretty much june 12 2024 sony pictures acquired alamo draft house for an undisclosed sum uh sony pictures had previously owned the lowe's theater chain after the doj released Lax enforcement of United States v. Paramount Pictures, which was the 1948 antitrust, or sorry, anti-monopoly uh, decision that forbid uh, film producers from also owning the means of film distribution at the time. Uh, when was it actually overturned? Because I believe it was entirely overturned relatively recently. Possibly. Review and termination of the Paramount Decrees. April 2018. In 2019, the DOJ sought to terminate the Paramount degree, Decrees, which would include a two-year sunset period as the practices of block, as to the practices of block booking and circuit dealing to allow theater chains to adjust. So, yeah. 2019, technically sunset fully in 2021. Sony is the first one to come back and buy a theater chain. And we'll have to see how it goes. Given the nature of Alamo Drafthouse, it seems pretty innocuous. Um, especially so given that Alamo Drafthouse had been purchased by uh, basically a venture capital company previously and was in steep decline for some time, including filing for bankruptcy in 2021 and shuttering six additional locations earlier this year after they changed it to Chapter 7 bankruptcy. <laughs> uh yeah uh it, it can't be worse than it was right? Uh, You're right and to sony's credit in particular one of the first actions that they've done having taken over alamo draft house is that they are reopening the six locations that were closed earlier this year and have offered uh to the employees who previously worked at those locations the opportunity to reapply for their jobs basically they have first dibs mm. so I wish them the best of luck, and I hope that they, you know, bring it back to Michigan. I want one that's close again. <laughs> yeah, I have wanted the Alamo Draft House back again. Like, I remember when you took me there just because we hadn't gone. I'd never gone. Mm -hmm. And, like, truthfully, I have very little recollection, recollection of the whole thing, other than I know that we ripped yeah. that movie apart, the, the sword art movie apart, mm -hmm. real bad. And honestly, it wasn't that bad of a movie, but we, we ripped it good. Yeah, we ripped it apart. Like, I'm not going to pretend like it's uh, Citizen Kane, but it's not that bad. Mm-hmm. That location is open as a theater again, which is kind of nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mentioned that. But yeah, a bit of a mixed bag, but glad to see somebody in that space. It's cycled through a lot of theaters over the years. Would you like to finish up with a couple of movie releases? I would love to talk about anything but the Supreme Court like right now. Big release of this weekend, Quiet Place, day one. 
Yeah. The, I believe technically it's a prequel to the A Quiet Place film duology. Yeah. Uh, read a couple of the reviews here, watched a few, and while reviews are mixed, they are generally positive, and in particular, there was praise given for uh, Lupita Nyong'o's performance in the movie. Uh, she does an excellent job as an actor who, given the nature of the movie, has very few lines to actually read. So that's very good to see. She's, you know, obviously been in quite a lot of pretty uh, substantial movies over the last, like, decade, I would say. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah, good honor for having a standout individual performance. Have you seen any of the... A Quiet Place films? Just curious. Uh, no, I have not actually. No, I haven't either. To be fair, I I have a hard time watching movies nowadays just because mm-hmm. very busy. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I, approaching television as a novel now, it's more like something I just pick up whenever I have a few minutes. Hmm. Other major release of this weekend is Kevin Costner's Horizon, an American Saga, Chapter 1. Okay. Being met much less positively, uh, which is unfortunate. This is both an original story being told, which is pretty rare these days, that something's not a remake or a sequel or a prequel or an adaptation. Um, and the way that they've set up the release schedule for this, having two chapters, basically two feature length films pretty much done and made and booked in for their, uh, film slots at the same time is unique and interesting. I think if nothing else, uh, it's unfortunate that doesn't seem to be working. Damn. Last piece. I'm actually curious. I'm going to look this up real quick. What's up? Because obviously upcoming, I believe later this year, uh, July 19th, we'll be having the release of Twisters, the soft reboot of Twister, the 19... God, what year was that? Uh, Like 96? 1996, yeah. The 1996 kind of breakout bit of a classic kind of movie half a billion at the box office that's pretty impressive um but that's not out yet twisters is going to be later what is out this week is the twisters what yeah oh there we go distributed by the asylum hmm so that's why it looks so bad, because it was made on a budget of a plate of sandwiches that their director, Michael Sue, probably brought in that morning. No, dude, it was a plate of sandwiches that they put like a cardboard box over and then just like wiggled around waiting for someone to come. That's how they got their mm-hmm. actors. So, yeah, really only mentioning this because I was shocked to see such a blatant, you know, rip off get posted up on Rotten Tomatoes, but you know, they've got their uh their racket, I guess, right? They know what they're doing. Tragically. Yeah. Spend four dollars and watching on Fandango at home. <laughs> I joined it very funny. The Rotten Tomatoes thing has the view more pictures button, but it's literally just the same two pictures. It's not, not even like more than two pictures repeated. It's just two pictures. They've just added the view more photos button because. I really enjoy that. The fact that uh, before the show, you and I were talking and we yep. usually just go through our movies a little bit. And uh, when you showed me the twisters, first thing was comparing it to bird Demic, And I was fucking mm-hmm. right. I was right. Yeah. Spot on. I know shit when I see it. It's amazing. What's up? Their their lead uh, actress is just Tiffany. Tiffany, no last name. 
That's oh, not yeah. a good sign. No way this is the same person. That timing was. Oh, played one of the kids. Uh, apparently, breakout role, 1990s. Or sorry, ni- yeah, 1990s, Jetsons, the movie. Yeah, it was a Jetsons movie? Yeah. Apparently, she voiced Judy Jetson. Uh, there was a Jetsons movie? Yes, in 1990. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just having a hard time getting that through my thick skull. Wild. It did not do well. You'll be shocked to learn. Well, how could it have possibly gone wrong? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, only other rated movie on her IMDb page. Uh, another distributed by, this is technically produced by uh, The Asylum, Mega Piranha. Let me see if there's any good... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This must be big uh, Sharknado time period. Oh, no. But... Oh, yeah. Here we go. Me... Of course, it's not gonna... Rotten Tomatoes, why do you suck so much? I'm just gonna screen snip your shit anyways. (laughs) Here we go. There's your Mega Piranha action. I hate it. Looks like fucking Splatoon on crack. Why is it diving out of the water to go get a car? Oh, I know. Not car. A helicopter. That's a helicopter. Yeah. Yeah. It's like diving out and it looks like it's in front of the helicopter, but I don't, I don't fucking get it. Wait, 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 23, 24. They've uploaded on their trailers part literally a third of the movie. 24 minutes out of the minute and 30 runtime. <laughs> Just as clips. I live. I love it. Great sign. Yeah. It's amazing. They have to practically give it away. Yeah, they do. That's all I have, though. Uh, last thought was I did see a really good, not really good, but had my thoughts going just about the state of the movie theater space in general, about why things are, why things that are succeeding are succeeding and why things that are failing are failing. Uh, and it was, you know, the person, I believe it was probably Red Letter Media, Red Letter Media or Chris Stuckman, um, brought up the very succinct point that the uh, vast majority of people during COVID changed their movie watching habits to not go to the theater and mm-hmm. that, that they just don't anymore. And that the vast majority of people that are going to the the theater are largely families with younger children looking for opportunities to not have to parent for you know two hours give or take yeah which is kind of interesting though because more or less that element at least of the theater industry has existed since the inception of the theater you know that's why kids movies exist in part is that you take your kids there to get a bit of a break I mean, the upside of that, I guess, is that while, you know, for lack of care, our generation seems to have been kind of, you know, lost in that regard. If younger generations are still being taken to the theater, it does bode well for a resurgence, you know, in, say, 10 years from now, when those people who are children going with their parents to the movies are going to be teenagers and young adults and thinking about what they want to do themselves. I like the way you think. That's my optimistic thought for the day. Everything sucks, but if theaters still exist in 10 years, they might not suck. They just might. Just maybe. 
I'm of the opinion in 10 years or so, the only real theaters around are going to be chain theaters. Probably. And I'm just saying that. I, I would I'm, not at all doubt that. Yeah. I am saying this as someone who's uh fucking lives in Grand Rapids and Celebration Cinema owns pretty much half this town. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Credit where it's due, though. Uh, as far as I can tell, and maybe it's just because they have contracts that they can't get out of. But as far as I can tell, currently, Celebration Cinemas are the only locations that are still showing Furiosa. Oh, yeah, that's true. So I finally was able to convince my dad to go and watch it with me yesterday. And he liked it. And I was glad to have him see that. But good. He's been a Mad Max fan for a while. And I was just like, come on. You, you, you know you like Mad Max. You like George Miller stuff. You know you're going to like it. Just take How did time you... and let's just go do this. Yeah, I was about to say, how does your dad like Mad Max, but he doesn't want to watch the Furiosa movie? Yeah, he was just kind of apathetic about it, I think. Ah, uh, yeah. Where it's just like, yeah, you know, I got errands I need to do, right? Why would yeah. I go to the movie when I have to do stuff around the house? Or, you know, that kind of attitude. So, but, got it done. I'm doing my part, George. I'm single-handedly probably funded about a tenth of all the people who have seen your fucking movie. <laughs> Damn, dude. I'm curious. I'm going to look it up. I'm going to be sad. I'm curious how it's doing in the box offices now. I haven't looked it up in a little while. Hey, it's officially made back its budget. Yay, not a flop. Not a flop. Oops, that's not good. Oh, that's bleak. Oh, no, sorry. That's the wrong. I was like, man, only $73,000 last week? That sucks. But no, that's the total earnings in Slovenia. Slovenia? Mm-hmm. How'd you get those results? Kind of, uh, Box Mojo. Oh, fair. They just have it. Yeah. Really surprisingly... Yeah, he's obviously poor everywhere, but kind of weirdly poor international watching as well. Really? It's, yeah. It's obviously not being shown in, like, China, of course, so maybe that's just a part of it. But, yeah. Oh, no, there it is. China. Oh, that's weird numbers. It's just its own region. But I... Those are two round of numbers for me to believe them. <laughs> What'd you find? Uh, apparently, it grossed exactly seven point eight million dollars in China so far, out of an opening of three point six million exactly. That's it's, just, it's too round. Yeah. Fascinatingly, I guess this no, this makes sense. I was like, oh, these numbers are kind of high, but it's just like, no, it's set kind of in Australia. So of course, Australians are going to be going out in large numbers to watch it. It's like their national uh, pride. Yeah, but South Korea, eleven point six million. That's a decent showing. Hmm. You know who I think could beat that? Mm, who's that? The North Korean numbers. Come on, North Korea. Uh, yeah. I uh, don't see them in here. I wonder why. Damn. Just for an idea how shit Slovenia's numbers are, they got beaten by Serbia and Montenegro. <laughs> like, what are you doing, Slovenia? That's like a weekend. Can we just make that like a thing? Like just making a uh, fucking all the um, not like, I'm sorry. I'm trying to have countries get pitted against each other based off their box no- number contributions, box office contributions. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be fun. Anything else you have to contribute to the show? Don't think so. And not so much myself either. In that case, uh, thank you everybody for listening to the next like five years of panic attacks for me. I think <laughs> this panic. We'll start attack, with that and we'll reassess. Yeah, this panic attack brought to you by the Supreme Court of the United States. Fuck you. <laughs>